Tourist Perspective. On the 8th of April of this year, France approved the so-called Molac Law, named after Paul Molac, a Breton National Assembly deputy from Morbihan, who has championed the cause of getting state support and recognition of minority languages which are close to extinction. The new law, which was opposed by French Education Minister Jean-Michel Blanquet and the ruling La Reine Party, aims to protect and promote regional languages across the country. Now, the law allows for schools to offer teaching in the medium of a regional minority language for the majority of the school day. However, the issue of giving state recognition to France's regional languages has been a hot potato since the French Revolution, with opponents saying that, according to French Republican ideology, all citizens are ultimately Frenchmen, and therefore no minority ethno-linguistic groups can exercise extra rights. That's an idea stemming from 1789, contrasting with the previous situation under the monarchy, in which many distinguishable groups had special rights and privileges within their regions. Now, in this edition of Paris Perspective. And to discuss the politics of language in France, I'm joined by James Costa, who's Associate Professor at the Sorbonne University, specialising in linguistic anthropology, Occitan, Scots Gaelic and minority languages. James, you're very welcome to the programme today. Hi, David. Thank you for the uh, invitation. It's great to have you here, despite the weather that is uh, very inclement, even for the month of May. Um, now, I brought up the French Revolution and 1789. Now, uh, the revolution strengthened the unified system of administration across the state here in France. The imposition of a common language, which was to do away with the other languages of France. Now, other languages were seen as keeping the peasant classes uneducated. Uh, in the foundation of the modern French Republic, do you think it was actually necessary for regional languages to be discouraged in order to educate and enlighten the masses for the greater good? <laughs> Um, well, that's um, that's actually quite a fascinating question, and it, it's uh, also a very complex one. It's not as straightforward as um, people often want it to be. Um, the first thing I think that what should be mentioned is that it goes back further than um, than the revolution. Mm. And I'm not sure actually that the revolution had that much of a role to play in the sense that it was it is something that people would um, draw upon in the 19th century to 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 then justify uh, anti-minority language policies in the 1880s. I'm not sure. I mean, the revolution itself played, dabbled with language, introduced um, notions, ideas, um, drew on previous uh, ideas as well, but I'm not sure. And the revolution itself did not uh, implement much. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you have to bear in mind that what was of importance to people back then was religion, not language. And and you see that in the fact that when um, the languages were uh, outlawed, so to speak, after 1794, uh, a lot of the... Um, nobody complained, basically. You, you have reports from uh, the VAR area near Marseille where people will say, oh, but this is fantastic. Yes, we'll agree with that. And nobody saw language as, as something that needed to be defended. And let's jump, let's say, 200 years um, forward now. I mean, more than 200 years forward uh, to what um, has happened now uh, in the last month, uh, just over a month ago, um, about this law that was pushed through in April. Um, like critics um, say that would be that this law that came through on April about uh, giving um, status to regional language will put an extra strain um, on um, the education budget and um, people will just be learning languages that will uh, essentially just become artificial, that will only be, sp be spoken within a little group, there wouldn't be actual living languages. Um, do they have a point there? And the other thing as well is if you are going to be teaching um, regional languages and bringing it up, boosting it up a notch with state funding, is the curriculum in place and are there enough teachers to actually implement, uh, let's just say, teaching hmm let's say, five out of seven hours a day in Breton, for example? Are the resources there? Um, 
Well, um, there's at least five questions in what you just asked here. Well, we'll start um, with, do they have a point that it will put strain on the education system by adding extra uh, regional languages into the curriculum? Well, I don't think anybody's saying that um, everything should be taught through the medium of Breton, say, tomorrow. The resources, for a start, wouldn't be there. What the law would actually enable is if there are uh, sufficient resources and if there is demand that it be possible. Mm. For the moment it isn't possible. For the moment what is possible is the teaching of a minority language for up to half the time uh, uh, during a week. Um, so a week is typically 24 hours so that's up to 12 hours. Okay. And the, the law was proposing that, uh, it go, that it it could actually go further than those 12 hours. So it's not imposing anything, it's just making it possible. And this was actually, this, this goes back to a few years back. You might remember back in the uh, early um, 2000, uh, uh, the 15 years ago, uh, the, uh, there was a proposal to integrate the D1 schools into the education system. Mm. Now, the D1 schools are those immersion schools yeah. where um, Breton is the first uh, language of education and then French is introduced later. And, and this, was, um, this proposal was rejected on the grounds that the, the French law does not allow for uh, teaching to take place in the minority language for more than half the time. Yeah. And so I think that would just pave the way to the integration of those schools into the education system, but it would not make anything compulsory. Gotcha. So, I mean, it's basically what you're saying is that this law opens the door to get the ball rolling and actually putting in place the yeah. development of schools mm -hmm. that will be able to have the resources Absolutely. of um, teaching in both languages 50-50. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, what about looking at it from... Um, literally a Paris perspective, um, uh, you know, we look back uh, into the 1970s, there was the rise of regionalist movements um, that kind of happened in Ireland, it happened in Scotland, along with a kind of a folk scene, etc. Um, it, it, it was that rise, and let's just say also, you know, separatism that maybe have come with us, at least uh, around the uh, the Festnoz and some of the, uh, the kind of um, festivals that you would have, is that still perceived... Is this regionalism still perceived as a threat to the integrity of the French state by, let's just say, the ruling classes in Paris, for example? Well, you, did, you mentioned the revolution earlier, and, and that's something that actually goes back a long way in the sense that one of the great fears of the uh, Parisian elite during the revolution was that the South would secede. Mm. And, and, that, that, uh, and that was... Mis uh, com completely uh, misled and it, uh, and it was uh, uh, wrong and I believe that it still is today and there is this fear that the nation will um, implode fragment, if, fragment yeah. if, the la if those languages are spoken and that is very much an ideological perspective on the very notion of diversity mm. not just uh, linguistic but also religious, cultural anything that is perceived to be different from the dominant culture is is seen as a threat. Mm. So I really don't think so. But, I mean, let's have a look. I mean, we're kind of going back to the 1970s there. Let's take the example of just south of the Pyrenees and yeah. the, uh, in Spain, post-1975. Now, the use of Catalan and Basque uh, was greatly discouraged under Franco. Uh -huh, um, uh -huh. And since 1975 uh, and the re-establishment uh, re of uh, mm -hmm. democracy in Spain, regional autonomy and language renaissance um, has led to, well, let's just say, you could say the resurgence of ETA and the Basque country, uh, which now, of course, have, has been, we hope, disbanded and there is a ceasefire definitely in place. But now, in 2021, you have Catalan independence, which has been driven by um, Carles Puigdemont. You see mass rallies uh, happening all across uh, Barcelona and across Catalonia. Um, Jure nos presos politics, get, you know, free our, um, our political prisoners. Do the French have maybe, are they right to view development south of the border as an indicator of what, would happen if state support is given to, uh, you know, the linguistic uh, autonomy of regions? 
Well, that's an interesting question, David, because um, that's a very, uh, if you if you don't mind me saying, that's a very French way of approaching uh, and This is issues. Paris' perspective, and the whole point of this program is to look um, at things from how the French would look mm. at it, or how the Parisians would look at it. And indeed, the French would think that it is, um, that it is uh, a consequence of giving more linguistic rights mm. to the regions. But if you look at the way that um, uh, separatism developed in, in Catalonia, and Scotland for that matter, mm. it had very little to do with um, uh, cultural rights. It had a lot to do with the fact that the, uh, political centres ignored more and more um, uh, political peripheries and, and that p people in the peripheries uh, saw their uh, prospects as being limited mm. by uh, a centralist perspective and it had very little to do with language and language rights themselves. And now look um, at, you know, I'm coming from Ireland and uh, you speak uh, Scots Gaelic. I mean, I used to speak fluent Gaelic when I was 12 and I've lost a lot of it and not, if not the majority of it now. But even in places like Ireland and the UK, where you actually have got government broadcast support. In Ireland, we have a thing called Tichy Cahar, which is the uh, Irish language TV station. We have BBC Alba and we've got, you know, Channel uh, Cymru uh, for Channel 4 uh, for Welsh. TV Bresh in uh, Brittany was set up in the 2000s and it went belly up because they couldn't find the resources to fund any programming for it. It became more and more francophone in its broadcasting and went eventually belly up. So with the law that has been brought in, even though it is helping getting the ball rolling in let's just say, uh, changing the attitude of the French straight towards minority languages, <laughs> is it too little too late to save them from obscurity? Well, <clears throat> In this particular case, I think you have to make uh, a separate case for each of the languages. Yes. We talked about this before, um, and uh, we did we, we, we made a distinction between the languages spoken in continental uh, Europe and the ones spoken in the, the islands. Downtown. But even there, uh, there is a, um, a big difference between, say, Basque and Occitan, between Alsatian and Corsican, between Breton and, and of course, all the Creoles. So each language would have to be looked at separately. And um, I think a different answer would have to be given for each of the contexts. Mm -hmm. The Creoles are still very much spoken. Uh, and even saying the Creoles in general is a bit of an oversimplification. Um, but say uh, Corsican is still very much spoken on the island. Which uh, is the most successful, do you reckon, of the uh, of the, the mainland French languages that is still, that isn't, which is the least endangered? Well, then again, you know, how do you measure success? Uh, it's, it's very hard to measure in any case with, via census, isn't it? Uh, indeed. Um, then again, I mean, Basque is still very strong. Mm. And the proportion of children who actually attend Basque medium education is is perhaps uh, higher in France than it is in Spain itself. And and so the language is still very strong in, in, in France, um, in the northern Basque country. Mm. Catalan, on the other hand, surprisingly, is very weak in the French part of Catalonia. You'd think that with the with support from the south, it'd be very strong, but it isn't. Yeah. German or Alsatian uh, benefits from the links with Germany. And the fact that fewer and fewer people speak Alsatian is actually very detrimental to employment, for example, because ah. people used to be able to go and work in Switzerland or Germany Just and speak the, the native Rhine, dialect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and. They can't do that anymore, and 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 so they're losing on opportunities. So, but and German is being developed there. Now, Breton and Occitan are very separate cases because they're not spoken anywhere else. Uh, anywhere else, yeah, they're not cross-border languages, indeed. No, yeah. indeed not. But then again, Occitan, same thing. You know, uh, it's probably more spoken in some areas than others, uh, where it fulfills different roles. <laughs> But speaking of borders, I mean, we do live in the European Union and uh, there is this European Charter for Regional and Minority Languages. Now, the Charter is currently signed by France, but hasn't been ratified. Um, now, what exactly does that mean? Like, this, this, this has been signed, but there's been a failure to have it ratified. And this has been a big topic of debate within French society. Where exactly are we with France's stance when it comes to this European Charter for Minority Languages? Um, well, to be honest, I don't think we're anywhere at the moment. <laughs> right. um, but on the other hand, 
Uh, I might surprise you by saying that it's probably not the priority in the sense that it, you might be aware of the fact that whenever a state uh, signs and ratifies a charter, uh, it is allowed to choose which parts it will uh, sign and ratify. Ah. And it has to choose a minimal, uh, no, a minimum of, uh, I can't remember how many, num how many uh, 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 articles. Now, uh, given what France had s agreed to sign at first, mm. I think um, it, it already does what it said it would do. Uh, and, and that included nothing uh, compulsory to do with either education or the law. So ratifying it right now would perhaps be symbolically important, but it wouldn't change Any anything. Any practicalities no. on the ground. No. And I mean, again, um, we are looking at priorities. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the priority as well, it's a, we can say it's a war on two fronts, maybe to the detriment of minority languages, where we have got the infamous Académie Française, which... Let's just say its prime directive is to prevent the anglicization or the bastardization of the beautiful French language by foreign influence. Hmm. So, I mean, um, when, you know, you know, also has this kind of, well, late medieval institution set up in the 17th century also been instrumental in the homogenization of the French language, but also to the detriment in suffocating the regional languages because Fran French came first or comes first. Mm. Is that right to say? Well, you know, but when it comes to the, the, the French language is a very strange beast. Mm. Um, it was never meant to be spoken by the masses. And this is probably something that the French Academy has, uh, has trouble with in the sense that um, it did back uh, the Frenchification of France, if you mm. like. Mm. Um, but so, there's something very odd about the French language. First of all, the elites in Paris complained that people, the people in the country did not speak it. And then when the people in the country did speak it after, say, the 1950s, they complained that they were not speaking it right, yeah. um, either because they had a regional accent or because they had an accent from the banlieue. So basically, you can never get it right Um and the French Academy uh, is, you mentioned the revolution earlier, the revolution did suspend it. Yeah. And uh, perhaps that was a very good thing. Yeah. We don't really... It should have, it should have stopped there. Absolutely. I think it... Uh, uh, you've, you've touched this upon something there that I think is also very important to bring up. And that is uh, indeed the, 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 the Parisian or the attitude um, uh, of let's just say people who speak Parisian French or the Parisian dialect of French, which has taken precedence, especially when it comes to accent. Uh, gl glottophobie, I think, is the uh, mm. name. Glottophobia. I, I don't know if that works in English, but you can see, you know, it's very fr much frowned upon in the French media. Uh, Unless you're watching a rugby match, you will never hear re regional accents um, presenting uh, a, a news programme or a television uh, programme unless it is specifically dealing with the regions. And I mean, um, in the UK and in Ireland, regional accents have always been a part of the fabric of broadcasting mm -hmm. because of the regional diversity of the, you know, of the, the British Isles as a, a geographical unit. But um, especially in the, like, in the 1970s, you had uh, Trevor MacDonald, the first black TV presenter in the UK, then moving on, especially in the 1990s, the kind of the real arrival of the Geordie accent on TV, probably pushed forward by comic uh, strips such as Viz magazine. But it really became an integral part of the fabric of broadcasting broadcasting in the UK. But here in France, you have to speak this standardised Parisian kind of flat French. Will that ever change, do you reckon? Is that too ingrained in the society here to be able to give a door open access to the regional accents mm. uh, onto the TVs? Well, it, it's interesting that you didn't mention the fact that the Prime Minister has a southern accent these days. Well, indeed, Jean Castex, <laughs> the first thing when he did come to power, when he took over from Edouard Philippe, everyone was going, uh, he, he la l'accent du sud. Yeah. Let's just say in the past year and a half since he's been around, mm -hmm. his accent, well, his last year has gotten much, much, much more Parisian, I think. Um, oh, I absolutely. Uh, you can, you can um, see it. He's, he's ironed out those uh, southwestern uh, twangs. I, but it's it's most definitely a um, a question of power struggle, and you mentioned the uh, you mentioned Britain. Uh, I I don't know about Ireland, mm. um, but in in Britain itself, um, I wouldn't quite agree with you with the fact that it was as easy as you uh, make it sound mm. to speak with a regional accent in 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 the, on the BBC uh, up until the nineteen seventies, as you said. Well, I was the seventies was the big changing point when it, it went yeah. away from the Queen's yeah. English and the newsreel yeah. kind of presentation. Yeah. But it, I think it really uh. got. 
gathered traction in the 80s and 90s, though. It did. But back, uh, I, I remember speaking with Mary Blance, who um, was the first person to speak uh, Shetlandic on, on BBC Shetland back in the early 80s. And it was extremely difficult. And she had to fight very hard to make that acceptable. So it was a, um, it was a, a, a battle that was fought and partly won. Yeah. Um, but, re- uh, but you have to remember that there was... Um, uh, hunger strike back in the early uh, 80s to have a Welsh television channel. So uh, these things were not given by the states. They, they were, were, they were taken mm. by the people mm. who thought that it was important enough to put these things forward. Mm. Now, for many reasons in France, it was never thought of, um, it, it was never thought to be so important that people would fight for a language. Yeah. And that itself is an interesting difference between France uh, uh, and the UK or yeah. Spain. Let's look forward to the 2022 election uh-huh. here in France. And I mean, it's gearing up to be fought very much along the lines of identity politics and regional issues. Now, to what extent, especially when we're looking at what's happened in Catalonia, to what extent do you think that regional languages could be used to influence the electorate and potentially appealing to a maybe a more popular sentiment uh, among proponents of minority languages and uh, heritage? I mean, do you think it could be manipulated to uh, the causes of any political parties? Well, uh, to give you a short answer, no. But I think Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, I mean, it's probably more complex than that. The first thing is to look perhaps at the regional election that is about to take place. Which is uh, literally a month. It's like a dry run almost. And in in this election, the question of languages might be used in some regions. Um, It might be of marginal, but still. Some importance. Well, emotionally. Um, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. if, it, if, it, if, it, if, uh, if, if it speaks emotionally to the people. Yeah, it is. Uh, it might be brought up in the Basque Country. It mm. will certainly be of importance in Corsica, mm. uh, where uh, there is a demand for co-officiality, uh, co-officiality yeah. whatever the word is. Yeah. Um, equal status. Equal status, That's thank it. you. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. and uh, 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 a demand that has systematically been rejected by the French government, but that is, um, but that is definitely present. Um, so the, the question, uh, of course, if you look at Alsace, Alsace no longer exists as a region. It is now drowned into this Grand Est, mm-hmm. uh, so greater eastern region. So uh, it will be difficult to articulate uh, claims about language there. So... But that, think, di- but that dissolution of the various regions mm. by the identity was an actual construct of the fabric of the new republic. I oh, mean, aye, absolutely. Much, they, yeah. just, they don't exist. No, absolutely. Exactly. But see, that's why it's interesting that uh, when the, the new regions were carved out back in 2015 and 2016, they brought back Occitania, mm. which probably says something not very positive about the future of the language. If the French state thought that it was benign enough to call a, to a region... give it its name uh, back. Yeah, exactly. Then it probably means that, uh, that they, the French state does not see it as a, 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 as a threat in, in any way. Now, to come back to your question about next year, identity politics will definitely be uh, of importance, but I think that um, uh, identity in this sense has moved on to um, uh, to religious issues, uh, mm. which has always been the... the, the uh, the fabric of uh, conflict in the French Republic. And um, the laïcité, the, the secularism versus the... Yeah, which uh, which is used as a way, as a proxy to talk about diversity and about uniformity. And that, uh, as you mentioned earlier, is is the, 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 the constant obsession of the, the ruling class in this country because they view any uh, form of diversity as a threat to... Um, uh, secede. James Costa, we will leave it at that. Thank you very much for well, joining you. me on the programme. Mm-hmm. James Costa, who is Associate Professor at the Sorbonne University, specialising in linguistic anthropology, Occitan and Scots and minority languages in general. Great to have you on the programme today. Well, thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.